The next category of evidence under morphological and anatomical is vestigial organs. Vestigial organs are those which are no longer in use. So they are no longer in use. And though they are no longer in use, but if they are present in the body of an organism, that indicates that they were functional earlier or they were functional in the ancestors. And if ancestors had that organ functional, then that helps us understand how our ancestors must have been. Certain examples again which would help us uh, get these evidences for evolution. Uh, we are talking of examples in human beings first and then we will take examples which are found in some other organisms also. In humans, nictitating membrane, nictitating membrane which is compared to be or considered to be the vestigial third eyelid is uh, vestigial in our case. In other organisms like frogs or aquatic organisms, this nictitating membrane is functional. If you remember seeing uh, the eye, we find there is a pink color structure here. This pink color structure, this is the nictitating membrane. And in aquatic organisms, this membrane also covers the eye. So we have two eyelids, the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid. And this third eyelid, which is vestigial in our case, but is functional in aquatic organism, it moves this way from this side to the outer side. And that is transparent. This membrane is transparent. So it protects the eye when the organism is in water. This means that our ancestors probably were aquatic. So these vestigial organs also help us understand how this evolution has taken place. Another one is appendix or vermiform appendix. It is considered as the remain of cecum. And in other organisms, cecum is the structure where cellulose digestion takes place. So if we have a small finger-like structure in that place that indicates that our ancestors had a functional cecum and they were able to consume cellulose. As our food habits have changed, this structure or our food or our enzymes did not uh, were not that tight that they could digest cellulose. So this structure became smaller and smaller and now it is present in the form of a vestigial structure. Wisdom teeth, they are also considered as vestigial, but we still have them. When we say we have 32, the last pair or the last uh, molars that we have are called wisdom teeth. They erupt at a very later stage, around 18 to 20 years. Many a times they do not even erupt, they just remain in the jaw bones. The reason why they do not erupt because we don't need them. We don't chew that much. So if you are not chewing, wisdom teeth are molars. They are meant for chewing the food. So if you are not chewing the food, then why do we have those uh, food or why, sorry, why, why do we need those teeth which are uh, going to help us in chewing our food. But because we have them in our jaw bones indicate that our ancestors needed these teeth for chewing because probably they were eating all raw food. Muscles of pinna which are known as auricular muscles. Auricular muscles that is the muscles of pinna or external ear. In other animals these muscles are functional and that is why these animals are able to move their external ears in the direction of the sound. We have seen dogs and cats moving their ears towards the direction of the sound. We do not have those muscles functional. Those muscles are there but they are non-functional. The reason we don't, know, don't need to move our ears. Our neck is flexible enough to move our head towards the direction of that sound. So in human beings, 
these auricular muscles, they are vestigial. One more example, there are about 100 such, uh, the scientists actually, Wilder Shem said that there are about 100 vestigial organs in human beings and we are taking some examples. In males, the memory glands or memory are highly reduced. Memory glands are reduced. In case of females, clitoris. In case of females, clitoris, which is considered as the rudiment and it has originated from the same structure as the penis in case of males. So in females, this clitoris is vestigial. So in human beings, out of 100, we have just discussed a few. In other animals, for example, in other animals, let us take the example of flightless birds. In flightless birds, like ostrich, the wings are very small and vestigial. So wings are vestigial. In case of python, in case of these snakes, that is in python, there are vestige of femur and pelvic girdles found. We know pelvic girdles are the structures where the bones of hind limb articulate to form the joints. And if there is a pelvic girdle, that means there is hip bone and hind limbs. But in case of python, we find only remain of this pelvic girdle or femur in the form of a very thin bone. But this indicates that the ancestors of python or boas, they were limbed organisms. So in python, femur and pelvic girdles are rudimentary or vestigial we can say. But this gives us a clue that their ancestors had limbs. Similarly, in horses, we find split bones. And these split bones are reduced digits. We know in horses, it is the third digit which has elongated and has become strong. We will talk about this when we come to paleontological evidence. In horses, the remaining digits, they have highly reduced in the form of very thin bones, which are known as splint bones. So vestigial organs also help us trace our evolution. By these organs, we can find out or we can understand that our ancestors or the ancestors of other animals had that structure. And as evolution took place, those structures were no longer in use. So slowly and gradually, they were reduced. And these present day animals or organisms find them or have them in the form of some remains or vestigial organs. So this is another uh, evidence under this category. The next evidence which we will discuss under the same category is going to be of atavism or reversion. The next uh, category under this, that is the fourth one, is known as atavism or reversion. Atavism or reversion means in the organism, if certain ancestral characters are found, that is, if some ancestral characters are present in the organisms which are produced these days or in present time. The example which we can take to understand this is, I'm sure you have heard of babies, very rarest of a rare case, but babies born with a small tail. So tail 
in a newborn. Now, this indicates that the ancestral character, that is tail, which is a part of all the vertebrate evolution, is present in the present day, or day organism. So, they are showing some ancestral trait. This is called reversion or atavism. The second uh, is, we just now talked of vestigial organs and in vestigial organs, we talked of auricular muscles. Auricular muscles in case of human beings are vestigial, but if they become functional, so functional auricular muscles, because of which the organisms or individuals are able to move their ears. So they are able to move their pinna, that is the external ear. Reason, in present day human beings, these auricular muscles are non-functional. They were present in our ancestors and our ancestors were able to move their ears towards the direction of the sound. But as we no longer use them, slowly and gradually they have become non-functional. But if any individual who has these functional muscles, that means that individual is showing some ancestral trait, that is reversion. One more example, which we know as lion boy, in which the human babies which are born, they are born with thick fur on the body. Fur on body. We know that our ancestors were monkeys and the monkeys have thick fur on the body. As evolution took place, this fur got lost or replaced by very short, fine hair. But if an individual or a baby is born with thick fur on the body, then that also will be considered as reversion or atavism. So, the, this is also one morphological or anatomical evidence. Now, let us take the last one in this category of morphological and anatomical evidence. Let us take the last uh, in this category, that is the fifth one, which is known as the connecting link. Connecting link are actually those organisms which share the characteristic features of two groups. And again, it will help us understand how evolution has taken place. The first example that we will discuss here is of Protopterus. It shares the characteristic features of bony fishes and amphibians. The characteristic features of the bony fishes which are seen in case of Protopterus are presence of gills, lateral line organs, lateral line organs which are the sensory uh, structures, then paired fins and dermal scales. So these are the characteristic features which are of bony fishes. The amphibian characters which they exhibit are internal nares, presence of lungs and three chamber heart. This indicates that this existing organism has certain characters of amphibians and certain characters of fishes and we know that life originated in water and from water first the amphibians evolved then they become totally uh, terrestrial. So, when they became totally terrestrial, there must have been some changes which were taking place. So, from gills, it got replaced to uh, the lungs. We know fishes have two chambered hearts, so now they have three chambered hearts. So, this is showing us a trend of evolution. The second example is of Ornithorhynchus. Which is known as the duck build platypus. 
and the other example is tacky glosses which is commonly known as the spiny ant eater and they share the characteristic features of mammals and reptiles so these organisms are also showing characters of a less evolved and a more evolved so probably it was the reptile which changed into the mammal so mammalian characters presence of hair diaphragm diaphragm which is a typical uh, mammalian character and memory glands that means when the young ones uh, were formed because they are eggling which is a reptilian character so when the young ones hatched they were fed with the secretion of the memory gland now reptilian characters they are oviparous that means they lay eggs and their eggs are polylecithal polylecithal eggs are the eggs which have sufficient quantity of yolk for the development because they are oviparous there is no connection between the mother and the developing fetus so the egg should have sufficient quantity of the yolk material and they also have cloaca cloaca which is a typical lower uh, vertebrate character which is a common opening for for the three systems that is digestive system excretory system and reproductive system so these two are very important examples let us talk of some more the next example is phenodon which is sharing the characteristic feature of amphibians and reptiles another example that we can talk of is balenoglossus and balenoglossus shares the characteristic features between chordates and non chordates so these are uh, one more is uh, chimera which is commonly known as rabbit fish so our fifth example is chimera or rabbit fish it shares the characteristic feature between bony and cartilaginous fishes so bony and cartilaginous fishes so these connecting links also help us understand how evolution must have taken place and that is why they are showing the characteristic feature of the little less evolved category and the characteristics of more evolved categories so these kind of uh, evidences which we keep under morphological and anatomical we talked of five homologous analogous organs we talked of vestigial organs we also took some examples of atavism or reversion and then the connecting links so all these morphological and anatomical evidences help us understand how this evolution has taken place now we will take up the next category after morphological the next category is embryological evidence